called this talk today to uh, bring in a, a friend of mine uh, who also uh, I think is a thought leader in the uh, field of the intersection between uh, mental health and environmental sustainability. So I have with me today someone who uh, is a psychiatrist. She's a uh, board certified uh, psychiatrist, uh, an analytic candidate, uh, did her uh, residency at UCSF. Uh, and is also the executive director of Profound Sustainability, which is uh, which is really the um, the reason that she's here to speak to you today. So, uh, please welcome Madeline Lansky. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I want to thank Brian for having me and for Google for having me. And I want to start off with a little anecdote from Wednesday. So I went to my local produce shop and I went to buy cherries because I love them. And they were especially beautiful. And there was this big mound of shiny cherries. And I turned to the grocer and said, I think these are amazing cherries and I think that this could be the best week of June for cherries. And he said, I don't know anymore. I don't know when the best time is for cherries because the weather's really weird. And I said to him, I kind of, I, I, because I knew I'd be coming here, I sort of experimented with this. I said, yeah, the weather's been changing a lot, and I think a lot of the growing seasons are really confusing. And he did this thing that I'm beginning to recognize as a kind of, a kind of subtle emotional moment. There's almost this, this sign I see that I recognize from working with kids and, and talking about the environment, which is he paused, he looked down at the cherries, and he was very quiet for about 30 seconds. And I think at another time I would have thought that he was just kind of looking at cherries. But I realized that he was very quietly, really pretty overwhelmed by what I'd said. And so I said to him, it's really overwhelming. I know I can only really think about it for three minutes at a time myself. And he said, I, I can't really think about it at all. And I, I said, I know what you mean. And so he said, so I don't. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, I understand. It's really hard to think about. And I left with about four pounds of cherries because, well, I was doing what we probably all do. I was distracting in some way, and cherries for me are a great distraction. So I really want to use this talk to hone in on this moment. It's, a, it's sort of a particular emotional moment. And I think it's something that people feel, and I suspect that the people who've come probably resonated with that piece of my flyer, which is that we all know that we're in a state of, of really tremendous environmental crisis. You know, we're seeing every day, we're, we're several weeks into the Gulf spill. We've seen what happened with Haiti with the earthquakes. There's just this ever increasing number of envi environmental disasters. And we're learning a lot of evidence about climate change and greenhouse gases. And I think that people really want to deal with this, but I actually don't think that we have a way that we're dealing with it personally and as a, as a human race. And my, my goal today is to offer um, the solution to the emotional despair of worrying about the environment that is a solution to the environmental crisis. I'm hoping that the intersection can give something to both. And what I'm really hoping to offer you in this talk is to be looking at systems as a whole in more of a circular fashion or a sustainable fashion and to sort of get off of the model that I see going on, which is much more linear, where there's one issue and one problem, people respond to it, try to fix it, get to the end of what they can do with it, and it kind of tapers off, doesn't really get solved. Maybe people schedule another meeting for a month out. And, and we're sort of all left with that same horrible feeling that something hasn't changed. So I, um, I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. I see kids, families, adults. Um, I do very intensive psychoanalytically oriented therapies with people with or without medications. And I really love the training that I got in the medical world and at the same time, I think it has limitations. Just in the way when I taught environmental education, I thought that there were limitations. 
that the environmental piece kind of stops short of the psychological realm and how people feel about the world and connecting with soil and knowing where food comes from. And that in the medical world, it seemed like there was a really surprisingly small amount of attention paid to our connection with the earth, our need to know where things come from. Um, of course, there was attention paid to good nutrition, but that these are really essential parts of mental health that go beyond diagnoses or particular medications that people might use, even though I, I use those things in my practice and don't actually have any particular problem with them. More interested in um, looking at the infrastructure and how we can change the infrastructure to give somebody the best shot at feeling good rather than kind of putting a Band-Aid over a problem. So I want to um, kind of go back to my environmental educator roots, which I did before I went to medical school, and tell you about my favorite metaphor for sustainability, which is the redwood forest. And so to use a redwood tree as the model, you have a seed with a lot of genetic material in a hard coated shell on the ground, and at the right time it germinates, opens up, and you have the beginnings of what will be a sapling. The sapling grows into a tree, it matures, it can reproduce either through seeds or even through its roots, and it gets to a point where maybe in 2,000 years, because these trees have amazingly long lives and can grow to huge diameters, that hopefully it will die a peaceful tree death and fall to the ground and begin to decompose. And perhaps you've seen this if you've been uh, walking somewhere where there is uh, lumber on the ground or things falling apart, that, that the most impart, important part, arguably, of a forest floor is actually the little microorganisms and bugs that break down the fallen tree and put it back into the soil. That what, you know, when I would teach these fifth and sixth graders, there'd kind of be this ew, gross moment about all these bugs. But this composting is really getting the, the really important building blocks out of the dead thing, putting them in the soil so that they can reinsert into the next seed. And it's a simplistic model, and, and we all kind of know it, and maybe it was in Lion King, but, you know, the circle of life thing. But um, it's, it's, it's actually something I am amazed at how little I see when I, when I hear about people doing advanced problem solving. So that is, I think, the most pure form of a sustainable set up. I would call that profound sustainability um, profoundly. Um, the way we've been doing it, and, I, and there, I'm going to take a break for almost like a little history lesson of how we started to develop in um, the Western world, especially the United States, a kind of linear model for how we do things and how we've really hit the wall both emotionally, even psychiatrically, and environmentally. So to go back to how the United States um, is composed as a melting pot, I'm just going to try to give you a sense of how I see the, uh, the population here. We're a lot of immigrants. We're people who fled for religious persecution, people who were brought here against their will or displaced to areas they didn't want to live, um, people who wanted to explore or find new things. And that makes us kind of an unusual country. It makes us exciting, unique. It also means that a lot of people came here already with a fair amount of exposure to trauma and already with um, maybe some vulnerabilities to psychological distress. A lot of people who fled other countries came because they couldn't stay where they were because it was too violent or scary. And I've worked in a lot of state hospitals and public schools. A lot of the people in those settings will very vividly tell you the kind of stuff that they saw before they came here or even when they got to the US. So you have this population. And about 150 years or so ago, the Industrial Revolution starts kicking into gear, which is basically what we know today as the machinery, the buildings, all of the innovations we have that are really quite wonderful that made modern medicine possible. Um, germ theory, the fact that doctors started washing between patients, antibiotics, medicines, computers, Google, lots of amazing things. At the same time, there's a huge buildup in waste. You know, there's sort of like a ton of plastic um, that nobody knows how to break down or compost. And all these other um, 
endpoints of these linear solutions to the things we want that, that don't really have a solution for what they're going to do. They're kind of like redwood trees on a forest floor that just sit there and never go anywhere. And then you see, as we enter the Industrial Re Revolution, this slightly haunting reality that our capacity to launch really huge wars and really maim and kill people really increases to a, to a kind of astounding amount. Um, hi. <laughs> um, so uh, not, to, not to diminish what happened in other wars, <laughs> but um, in World War I and World War II, all the countries are involved. And um, the capacity to just, just kill hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Also, we have good enough medicine at that point that instead of people dying, we actually kind of patch them up well enough so you have a lot of people who've survived um, traumatic brain injuries, terrible shell shock, um, people who have lost limbs. And you have huge parts of the population that are now being exposed to veterans with trauma who are um, maybe have been bombed or had their own losses. And I, I'm, I think I'm trying to um, maybe show you how much sort of, you know, there's this idea that 70% of the population at any given time has a psychiatric diagnosis, and I, I'm, I, I think that might be true, and I think it's kind of for good reason, that we have these setups to not do so great. So you move into um, just having this population that's having increasing difficulties with the challenges of being alive, and after World War II, this amazing infrastructure develops, the post-war um, growth, the development of suburbs, quality of life goes up exponentially for the average American. But these are systems that are supported, supported by um, oil growth and petroleum. And the United States is really compelled to put most of its effort, politically, I think, into maintaining the oil to maintain the structures. So you see a drop in funding for social services, mental health, education, the kind of fabric that would keep more vulnerable individuals from falling through the cracks. You see an emphasis put on moving into suburbs and to building out, which is sort of the American dream, but I think ends up with a lot of people feeling very disconnected, lonely, and sad and not really dealing with any connection with others or with food growth or the lands. People start to really not know where things come from. They start to drive and not really move around as much. Somehow it makes sense that people would go to a gym and run in place on a machine rather than to be outside moving around or to eat things in packages rather than food that they grow. These are things that actually make more sense to us now, but they, if you think about it, don't make tons of sense. And then in the urban centers, there's a collapse. These become places where there's a lot more poverty. In the 1980s, you see crack cocaine move in, which I actually remember moving in, and just uh, the explosion of, of human tragedy that happened when crack cocaine came in. So it's a drug that works fast. It um, creates a, a quick high. It creates a lot of violence. It's cheap. A lot of babies were born crack exposed. They uh, tend to have a lot more psychiatric symptoms, need a lot more services. A lot of parents of those kids are in jail rather than taking care of their kids. The jail populations go up. There's actually a reduction in psychiatric and mental health services and in education supports and an increase in prison populations because in a way they're much less expensive to maintain. And um, I think people are scared to be outside. It's harder to collect in, in, in public spaces. There's a lot more television, media, watching really disturbing stuff, getting overstimulated. Um, and that leads us to today. I'm looking at all your faces, and you all look very. But it's, I, I realize it's depressing, and to try to shift gears on you so I don't. Yeah, <laughs> that was a good sad face. Um, so I think that nobody meant for this to happen. I don't think that this was some grand design of some evil genius to slowly separate each other from ourselves internally, in our relationships, or from the land. I think that people got excited, found some new stuff, and wanted to keep going with it, and now we've got a lot of garbage to clean up. 
It was a linear system. It hit its end. It's hit a wall. We now have a whole bunch of people who, who really need much more than they're getting. And we have literally a lot of garbage that's built up. And I like to go back to the Redwood model because what we don't really have at this point and what I want to see and want to encourage you to look for is some kind of equivalent of composters and decomposers. That we have a lot of waste, but we don't even have to see it as waste. We have a surplus of all this mucky gunk that if we can really look at in a new way, we might be able to find some interesting opportunities and solutions that there's building blocks in the muck, and that they're the building blocks that could go in to support the seeds of some kind of new opportunity. You know, when people come into my clinical practice, they've usually hit the end of their rope. Something really, really upsetting maybe has happened, but it's, it comes on top of a lot of years of, of things not going well, of a lot of sadness and isolation and, and symptoms. And so to get to me, um, usually they've, they've hit a wall and they just don't feel like they can do anything else. And this is a linear problem. So coming into a practice like mine means looking how to make it sustainable. And going through the details of how somebody has gotten where they are is really about trying to compost and look through the muck of what they're dealing with to actually find what's good and rework it to make their lives more sustainable. It takes a lot of work takes a lot of patience. It doesn't happen overnight. A certain percentage of people, or everybody at some time says, I want this to happen much faster. Um, it's usually pretty frustrating to hear that it, it won't happen any faster than it happens. But it's often a very rewarding process, and people tend to feel a lot more freedom and choice and opportunity, and they tend to see positive effects in their families and in their relationships. So I want to be... Really, really, you know, I'm, it's so exciting the position you're in at Google because you have such power to be not just creating things but looking at how infrastructures are made. And I think you have such interesting opportunities to be bringing this sustainable perspective into the work you're doing here, even into how you are with yourselves, that, that this would really start with ourselves and finding ways to make our own lives sustainable, even for looking for ways in our lives that they're actually uncomfortable or there's something really unpleasant. I think the way we live in our, in our world right now is to really try to push that away pretty, pretty actively and hope it doesn't bubble up. And then oftentimes it does and it gets, it kind of turns into a mess. But that there's an opportunity to really tune in and use that as a way to make oneself sustainable to look at one's relationships with others and find a way to make them sustainable, or in our families, or in communities. You know, that community is where you work, um, where you live, a company, a government, an economy, a school, and even expanding it out into the world. That there's a kind of paradigm shift that we're really needing right now to make things into circles out of linear systems and to be finding what waste needs to be broken down into helpful building blocks. Now this is where the Haiti piece comes in, and I think it's uh, an exciting one. I've been, since the earthquake in Haiti in January, involved with um, the Sustainable Haiti Coalition and trying to look at integrative and even hybrid models for how to talk about sustainable regrowth and how to look at how to have an intersection between the human needs in Haiti and the environmental needs. And I don't know if you guys sort of know uh, a lot about Haitian history, but one of the big issues that's ongoing is actually literally the soil. If you look over the island of Hispaniola, one side, the Dominican Republic, has forests, and the other side, Haiti, has dry land. And so literally and figuratively, Haiti needs to be reworking things so that the soil is fertile again, so that it can grow, so that there can actually be food independence and an ability to feed people. I mean, there's some, I don't mean to imply there's none, but that there's a real opportunity there to be really thriving in an agricultural way. 
And if you look at the Haitian population, which went into the earthquake with a lot of trauma, a lot of poverty, a lot of, um, I think, feeling of humiliation about being, you know, one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere, that put on top of that that people have seen their loved ones either be killed or maimed, or they've been maimed, they've been hungry, all these things, that, that they really need mental health treatment. You know, I was approached a number of times at, at a lot of the conferences I was at, are you going to go to Haiti, are you going to go to Haiti? And the answer is complex. I would love to go to Haiti, and I would love to go down and, and provide psychiatric help. But there's also this kind of knowing that I have that the infrastructures have to be put together in a way that if someone like me offers a, a medical or psychiatric service, that the person who goes back into their lives is going to be able to sustain the benefit that they got from that kind of intervention. So there's this huge downfall of, of, of amazing economic support from people who want to help Haiti. There's, there's this immense amount of potential. And I think there's this crossroads. Are we going to look at each problem in Haiti as a separate linear issue? Or are we going to look at the interconnectedness, sorry, interconnectedness of all the parts, look for how they intersect, and find the big picture, and then do the planning and the funding for how to solve those problems? That's, that's the kind of mind shift that I think that, that I'm talking about. Um, I want to end with a quote from one of my favorite writers who I think really kind of inspired this journey for me of the connection between thinking about people and thinking about the environment, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it's a quote where he said, every wall is a door. So I think we're at a wall. I think we're at walls. I think that there are doors to open. And I think that Opening a door at a time of crisis is one of the best things that you can do for mental health. When you put aside all the kind of modern interventions we have for those kinds of problems, people need to have a sense of hope and a kind of way to develop their own sense of resilience that they'll be able to get through problems and solve them. And for a lot of the despair that we're seeing, you know, the despair that, that brought people to this talk or the despair that people might feel in Haiti, looking into really, really profoundly sustainable solutions, I think will be very helpful to people emotionally. I think will really help people settle down and really help shift with a lot of the symptomatology that, that I think is out there maybe more than we're perceiving and more than is readily obvious without taking a moment maybe with the grocer and watching his face when he gets quietly overwhelmed. So with that, um, thank you for listening. And why don't we shift to a conversation, questions and answers. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know if there's another mic, but I'm happy to. Re you can either come up or I'm happy to repeat. Oh, let me just ask. Um, I have two, two boys, 16. Fine. Sure. Thanks. I have two sons, 16 and 20, and I ask them occasionally how confident are they that their future is going to be positive? And they're, they're doing well, they're, they're fine in school and everything, but. I really have questions about what they see as the environmental issues, the political issues, the um, all, all the crises that seem to be coming together um, for them at a very young age. When I was their age, I didn't have to face all these things. How do you, how do we help get resilience in those folks um, who, quite honestly, are privileged middle-class white kids, as opposed to, uh, or who have much more advantage than a lot of people in this world? How, how do we build hope for the future? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, that's something I've been really interested in, and I've I've started talking about actually with kids, and um, and sort of in the early stages of doing a 
some kind of documentary around interviewing kids about that. Um, because they, when I talk to kids about this, they tell me that they feel like they're constantly being told that the world is falling apart almost every day and that they're being told that they're going to have to be the ones who come up with the solutions and they get so they feel very pressured that they're going to have to come up with it all i think that some of the more vulnerable kids get very involved with like the 2012 stuff do you guys know about this there's this there's this concern that the world's going to end in 2012 so maybe the more kind of nervous kids might uh, talk about it a lot and have like a lot of bake sales to raise money for things. <laughs> it's very cute. And then, um, you know, other kids I sort of see slip more into kind of fantasy video game realm where they just get really, really frightened. And when you look, I mean, if you look at, at how people sort of behave and how they look, they'll just, you know, the ones who aren't doing so great look kind of more fragmented and not kind of neither here nor there, and they might have a lot of explosive episodes or not doing well in school, but they're basically so overwhelmed with anxiety they kind of don't know what to do. What I've been really struck by when interviewing um, the kind of kid you're talking about, sort of, you know, in the luckiest 1% of anybody walking around on the face of the earth, um, and, and they're totally freaked out, I find that they don't think very sustainably. Even the ones who I interview who, who go to really progressive schools, I still hear that people are trying to solve linear problems with linear solutions. And that there's a kind of looking at, looking at the big system about what a big system would need to function and then moving from there to how to make application is something I think kids aren't getting either. And one of the best things that we can do for them, rather than telling them, uh, you know, the world's falling apart and guess what, it's yours to fix or you're gonna die, is, because uh, they really feel that way, a lot of them, is to actually be giving them a lot of science, a lot of training. I would love to be seeing huge science um, fairs where kids compete for, um, Innovation, innovations and inventions and, and do problem solving around huge systems issues that are difficult. You know, there's a lot of programs where kids are, are actually doing really neat things like that. And getting our curricula focused around that would, would I think, be really amazing. Also, teaching about interconnectedness and how um, working out with one part of the system affects the other because you know, otherwise the task is too daunting and you really kind of can't get your mind around it. And in my, in my experience, when somebody can't get their mind around something that's really scary and actually involves annihilation, that, that that's actually where a lot of symptoms develop because they, you sort of can't keep it together. So there's a kind of grounding in education and an approach to education using this kind of making lines into circles that I think would be helpful. And then what to say to kids like that, you know, I, I'm always sort of, I kind of vote for normalizing anxieties. Like I would, you know, yes, of course you feel that way. It is really scary. How can we help you with it? And to be, you know, taking dinner time to talk with kids, well, what would you like to see happen? One of the things I've, I've also noticed is everybody sort of talks about this like somebody else is gonna fix it. And the kids do too. But really, we're going to fix it. We're the ones who are going to fix it. And once we make that decision, it's actually can be very fun after that. But being immobilized with fear is, is a very terrible place to be. Next, next question. Thank you. The question was, what about kids who aren't fearful about it or don't really care about it because they're not aware? Um, or, or adults, too. You know, I'd like to think that one of the reasons that I could not, for the life of me, get in to see Avatar in 3D and IMAX, <laughs> I had to choose, was that 
everybody was seeing that movie. And I think a lot of the appeal of that movie was that it was actually getting at a lot of this stuff. So I think it would actually be really hard to tell who really, truly does not know about this, who is truly and utterly ignorant of it, and who is kind of doing their best to deal with how scared they are and don't have that much information about it. I, you know, I really loved teaching environmental education because you'd get kids, a lot of them from urban places, never been on a hike, pretty scared of the woods, don't really do great in classrooms with four walls um, and fluorescent lights. They're bouncing around in the woods, jumping, screaming. If they're being rowdy, you hike really hard for a mile and then learn science. And those kids did great. You know, they learn a lot more in those kinds of settings. And a lot of people just don't even know that it's like that. So getting people outside, having people eat fresh food, I think probably we might underestimate how many people only eat processed foods, don't eat fresh food, can't get to any fresh food. It's actually literally too, sort of too far away where they live to get to fresh produce. So there's some very kind of simple um, ways to get people connected. I would vote for what's great first, what's delicious, what's beautiful, to make a kind of relationship, and then to talk about how to sustain the relationship. I think that maybe that's a more hopeful, that would probably be a more hopeful twist. Thank you. Yeah. So the question was, um, this gentleman with some humor admitted he's concrete in his thinking and that he can see examples of um, circular, did you say circular or sustainable? Moving from, uh -huh. okay, moving from linear to circular beyond the individual level onto a global level. Is that, did I get that? I don't think the examples are great. I think it's a matter of degrees. That's why I brought up the Redwood example um, because it's, 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 it's so close circuit and it works so beautifully. Um, I'm actually gonna bring up uh, my friend's restaurant. Gather, have you guys heard about Gather in Berkeley? Um, so there's this really neat place that's opened up. Um, it's, it's kind of like a, do you guys know what slow food is? This principle of kind of getting back into having really uh, thoughtfully produced food that's local, you know, organic, animals are treated humanely. Um, so there's this restaurant that's been built serving these kinds of foods. There's meat. They actually slaughter the animals in the back and use all the parts from the animals. And there's this commitment to that. All of the uh, fixtures are recycled. And all of the produce and uh, you know, meats come from really local farms with whom they have a relationship. Um, it's connected to the David Brower Center. And so I actually think that their energy supply is probably primarily solar. Um, the, all of their alcohol is organic. And it is a system that I think really does its very, very best. And, it, and it's really good food. It's not sort of like this bummer, you know, tasteless tofu horror meal. It's, it's really good. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really intended to put this into action. Now, because I also, well, I'll just say, I can get pretty geeky about this stuff, so I could start to even go into the gather model and look for all the ways that it's not sustainable enough, you know, down to what about the water supply, how do you do with wastewater, what do you do with actual food, how do you actually compost the food, what do you do with plastics, you know. Then you get into how does that system, which is doing quite well, interface with a bigger system, and then we actually get into how are we dealing with garbage? How are we dealing with our water supply? How are we actually dealing with um, breaking down plastic? I think the day we figure out how to fully break down plastic into building blocks will be an amazing and exciting day. That would be the way to think about it.
and to, um, I think, really be looking at everything we have. Have you, have you heard of this line of thinking called cradle to cradle? Have you heard? That's a book. And a, so cradle to cradle is this idea that whatever you would start with, um, you know, let's just use plastic for an example, that you would look at the life of that plastic from the moment it was made all the way to the moment it was broken down and made into something new. And that there would be attention paid to every point in that cycle. So that's a wonderful um, model of something that's starting to happen and they, I think, are very involved with um, working with companies and, and chemicals and trying to get this going. And you'll even see, I don't know, have you seen those playgrounds that are made of like chewed up running shoes that are bouncy and stuff? So th I, that's great. I would say that that's not quite cradle to cradle because we still have to figure out how to get building blocks. You know, it's, it's this next level. I hope that's an answer to, to your question. So your question to follow up is, is this going to be mostly small circular systems, not looking at a big system? I would say that the task, I, I think it should be a big system. It's just such a huge task. That's why the Haiti idea is kind of interesting, because there's, um, you know, we have so much infrastructure in place, and it, it basically works great. It just has a ton of waste and isn't sustainable. So shifting into a sustainable model takes tons of money and, and, and innovation and, and change in how we see and think. I think that's the overarching goal. But I think that we're, you know, right now it's going to be more and more little systems putting that into place. And then I think it's going to be the policymakers and the people who make stuff who are going to become interconnected and connect the dots. And to be looking for how to make it bigger. You know, in the same way that the internet the internet didn't exist before it existed. I didn't, the internet didn't exist when I was little. And then all of a sudden the internet is an intrinsic part of every single thing everywhere, at least, you know, in Northern California and in many parts of the world. It's not in every part of the world, but it's, we take it so for granted. And that's, that's kind of a revolution. That's kind of like a internet revolution. I think this is a sustainability revolution. Just, it sort of sinks into every level. I'm giving you the most idealistic, philosophical way of thinking about it. Yeah. Do you want to come up or speak up or? Yeah. Ah, it's so true. And it's usually the last. Well, let me repeat your question. You said that um, you're talking about not just with environmental projects, but in, in group projects that you work on, that you're trying to advocate for a kind of sustainable approach to what's being worked on and that it's hard to convince people to put the upfront energy or investment to get all the way to the end of the circle, and that a lot of times they abandon at the last, what would you say, three quarter? Last quarter. And, it's, and in my experience, it's the last quarter that makes a difference. Uh, so how do, you, how, do you, how do you solve that? Yeah, that's like a trillion dollar question. But... That's a door. Let's, that's, a, that's a wall. Let's find a door. Um, I think it's really hard to convince people to invest up front. You know, a lot of times people will come into my practice and they'll say, this is so expensive. And, it, and it, you know, it, I, I totally sympathize with that feeling, but 
so is um, having a really messy divorce or losing your house or you know never quite meeting your potential because it's so hard to pull it together um, at your work and so I think it's a little hard to prove theoreticals of how much it would cost not to do it but um, at the at the end of the day I think that this is where the task is to, to, to help with the teaching around that and I think it's also about um, making it fun and sexy I think that's a very silly answer but it's there's something <laughs> You know, it's sort of like you it's like with a kid, you gotta clean up your room if we're gonna have fun. And you know, the last it's like the last quarter of the toys and junk all over the room might be where you have to stand outside the door and cheer, cheer them to get that last piece done. But that's where there's a fair amount of um art. And the other thing I think you can do is look for evidence of organizations and teams who've put in that investment and how well they've done you know Toyota is a great example of that and and the the difficulties that Toyota has hit it's because they stopped doing what was sustainable just, you know the the Toyota system of the five whys where you just keep looking at how to make the problem you just keep breaking it down by five levels to make sure you've covered all the potential problems and, and when all those car accidents um, happened, basically, from what I understood, the president of, to, the, of Toyota apologized for not doing what had worked. So that's a, I think that's a really good example. I think there's a way to get people excited about finishing the task. That's, that's one of the, the things that I like about psychoanalysis is it kind of gets you excited about dealing with something that would otherwise be kind of unpleasant or boring. To actually get excited about figuring out the last quarter, um, and and that's kind of a an infectious infectious excitement. Well, yeah. Right. Um, no, I mean, it's, it, that's, okay, so let me repeat. I, you say stuff, I'm excited, and I have to get it on the mic. So you're saying that usually when this conversation has happened, it's already too late, that the damage has already occurred, and you don't want that to happen with the environment and with the planet. Well, you said the planet. <laughs> um, that's my worry, too. I think, you know, I, I think a lot about, I, I, I think in metaphor a lot. So I think about, um, you know, let's say, sorry, I, I'm sorry, I always bring up these bummer examples, but then I, I'll try to make it light afterwards. But let's say you have a, a teen who's suicidal. And, they're, and, and, I, and like really, like for real, not playing around. And so they get into treatment and, you know, you try to get the family involved and say, no, really, you really have to figure out your family infrastructure because this kid isn't doing well and now in some families they might say well he's just trying to get attention or all the other kinds of things that people say when they're actually so overwhelmed and frightened with a terrible problem that they don't know what to do so they dismiss it and so there's this really tricky balance I, I, I've been in this position of having to convince people to get moving on it so that they don't have to do an after conversation about a tragedy that wasn't averted and or you know in the ICU you know when I was a medical student you'd sort of be in the ICU and there'd be these terrible medical things happening and you'd have to go out to the family and talk to the family about what they want and you know fairly often someone in the family or a lot of the family just don't want to talk about it they leave you know People would, you know, snort cocaine in the bathroom. You know, people just don't want to talk about this. But that's when the outcomes sometimes aren't good. And so what I, you know, in a way what I'm trying to bring with this talk is to get the consciousness about how we avoid in front of the disaster. Because there's a whole psychology to avoidance. 
and it's, it's it, it, the, we avoid more the, the more frightened we are that we can't fix it. Now, how to apply that at a, on a, at a particular team at a particular work site, I, I think it's definitely doable. I think at that point you have to kind of learn the nuances of any given team, and that's what I do in my consulting practice, but that was a big answer and a smaller answer. Other questions, comments? Emerson quotes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so your question, if I understand it, was that your the, the challenge you face is less about people who don't know about sustainability than people who do know about it and choose not to act on it or choose sort of to turn a blind eye or a blind ear, or I, I, if I understood you, or say, I'll be dead by the time this really hits. You didn't really say that, but I, th I thought you kind of were. Um, and how to work with that. And I, I think that's what you were sort of, that seems linked to what you were asking also, the, the guy before, a, a little. Well, interconnected me, I think everything's linked. Um, <laughs> no, I really do. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's really part of, I, I think the reason I think it's connected is, I think this almost feels like a game of chicken, you know, that, that racing game where who's, who's going to win and whose car is going to crash into the, <laughs> off the cliff of, you know, who cares and who doesn't. And I don't think the answer is simple, but it's the same answer I feel about most things being a psychiatrist. Because at the end of the day, these are really hard problems. And there's, you know, we're such complex beings. We have so many defenses against hearing anything hard. And I think the more upsetting the news, the more um, robust the denial. Um, in my practice, I. My my big challenge is, you know, people will say, oh, you're a child psychiatrist. Is it all the parents' fault? <laughs> and, you know, I don't think I am ever, I don't think it's ever acceptable for me to answer yes to that question because those parents were all kids. So was it their parents' fault? Well, why was it their parents' fault? How did the whole thing get going? So... In these, you know, I'm describing these families, in the family that doesn't want to talk about suicide, or in the family that is so humiliated that their kid needs treatment, there's the constant task of finding a way to connect with people who might be really disturbing you on a very core basis. I mean, somebody saying, I really don't care about the environment, I just don't care, I know it's going to happen, I'll be dead. I, I actually think that, that that's a very upsetting, rattling thing to say. And, and I think it, I would imagine that it creates a sense of paralysis and sort of astonishment in you. And I would, you know, the, the, when, if I put on my psychoanalytic cap, I would think that maybe they're that frozen. Maybe they're that paralyzed. And maybe they don't want to feel that way. Kind of like the grocer. You know how the grocer said, he looked down, he looked really shocked, and then he said, oh, well, live for today. <laughs> you know, he, he could really only do it for a, a minute at a time. But what I've learned, I mean, I really like my job, and I think there is a lot of hope. And these people um, do respond to crises. Uh, a lot of times these stories do turn out well. And so it's actually about finding the compassion to help people who don't want to hear and are doing this, 
and saying horrible, terrible things and want to fight about it. And then, you know, whenever I seduce myself back into that line of thinking, I try, again, I try to make it a game. How am I going to connect with this person? I used to make that a game as a medical student because you get screamed at like all day. You know, it's just like, you know, who's screaming at me now? Kind of. <laughs> and I, and it, after a while, because it, you know, either you're gonna just not make it, or you're gonna make it. And the way I chose to make it was to f find a way to connect with anybody, anybody, for any reason, even the worst person. And it, it was a fun game. <laughs> It worked. I got an award for Bedside Manor. You know, it, it really paid off. Um, so when people are acting despicable, I think the challenge is to refuse to buy into it and to insist upon seeing what's good in them until they have no choice but to follow your vision of them. <laughs> That's my technique. I know. <laughs> Have fun with that one. <laughs> yeah, and you know, like, really, have fun, you know. Uh, do a lot of fun stuff. And um, have a lot of great cherries, because it's, it's really hard work. <laughs> and find allies and people to kind of decompress with. I think there's a lot of people. I think most people want to deal with this. I, 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 re I really talk to everybody. I, I, I make it my business to talk to every kind of person I can. And a lot of people will kind of reflexively say some kind of obnoxious, negative, dismissive comment. And then if you, if you, if you go in like three more layers and, and talk about things that really matter, that they really care about, they actually will do the face that the grocer had. I, I have yet to find anybody who hasn't. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I work with like severely disturbed, very violent people. You know, people who say that are, uh, have no moral conscience. I ha actually have yet to find one of them with someone who has no moral conscience. They might be out there. I'd, they might be. I, I, I'd actually be interested to, to, to ex experience contact with that. But So you're talking about politicians or people who say outrageous things and not being able to interact with them. Looking for the good. I want to I want to play with an idea in in the next 4 minutes that I'm being shown I have. I have this idea and you're not mentioning the tea party, but I have this idea about the tea party. Okay, okay. <laughs> that I I <laughs> I, I feel that I could, could see how the kind of anxiety and upset and finger pointing and rage that's going on in that particular movement would maybe be a part of the kind of historical perspective that I laid out. That I think that on an unconscious level, we are all feeling um, like we're about to slam into a wall at 50 miles an hour. And I think people respond to that unconscious anxiety in different ways. One of the things that people do is to blame uh, people that they think have a lot of power for not getting rid of the terrible feelings they have inside. And you know, it's uh, some of the some of the arguments that I hear various people in those movements make literally just don't make sense. Like they don't hang together cognitively for me, and I, I I'm really open to trying to make them work, and I can't. But if, if I were to shift seeing what they say as everything's falling apart, I'm working all the time, I can barely feed my family, I'm scared all the time, everything I watch is about things falling apart, nobody's fixing it, I hate you. <laughs> then I think you can, you know, maybe individually it's, it's hard for you to go find somebody in that position, but I think that there there's huge ways that we can move as groups to be connecting. You know, the, the way that I see people connecting with the Tea Party is with a lot of anger, which I think gets people riled up. But this is about connecting and bringing in and helping with anxiety. 
Well, it's really been fun. Thank you for being such an engaging audience and um, for having me. Thank you.